Good afternoon. It's Wednesday the 11th of uh, January 2017, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Brian Gerrish. Of course, with me in the studio, Mike Robinson. And uh, we're delighted to say we will be joined by live video Skype link by Alex Thompson, uh, who will be bringing us Eastern approaches with reports from uh, Holland and uh, on the continent. Uh, well, the sun has uh, come out, and I think the sun has come out in politics because apparently we can uh, absolutely trust Theresa May, our new Prime Minister. Uh, yes, yeah, so the Telegraph uh, highlighting this. Uh, and uh, Theresa May sets up a blind trust to manage an estimated £145,000 share portfolio. Now she's Prime Minister. Uh, she didn't have this blind trust set up uh, prior to becoming Prime Minister, so all the years of Home Secretary, she didn't worry too much about uh, whether there was a conflict of interest in anything that she, she was doing. But now that uh, she's got a broader portfolio, she now has to worry about conflicts of interest. So she's put these shares in a blind trust. Uh, and uh, the Telegraph quoting a number 10 spokeswoman who said, blind trusts are well-established me mechanisms for protecting ministers in the handling of their interests as they're not involved in any decisions on the management acquisition or disposal of items in the trust. Uh, she set it up when she became prime minister. And there's what there's six others uh, that are on the uh, register of members' interests from uh, just prior, before Christmas who also have uh, their uh, financial affairs set up as a blind trust. Uh, Robert Buckland, QC, who's a solicitor general. Baroness Neville Rolfe, minister, minister of state. Uh, uh, Earl Howe, Lord Nash, Philip Dunn, Lord Keane. Uh, and uh, so uh, the... Spokeswoman for number 10 was asked why a blind trust wasn't necessary when, when she was Home Secretary and uh, the response was that the Prime Minister has a far wider set of public du duties than the Home Secretary. Accordingly, uh, the blind trust was established when she became Prime Minister. And the other interesting aspect of this is that uh, for the first time she has mentioned uh, her husband's uh, relationship to the financial industry in her register of interests. Oh, so that wouldn't have applied as Home Secretary at all? Uh, no, no, apparently not. Now, uh, of course, a blind trust, you hand your assets over to somebody, some trustees who are supposed to look after them and they can manage them as they see fit. You have no further interest in those until you uh, get take the profit. It, take, until you get the profit. Yes, yeah. that's exactly right. Uh, and it, it sort of uh, reminded me a little bit of uh, this organisation, Bank of England Nominees Limited. Most people aren't aware of it, a nominee company. And of course, if you look at the definition of a of a blind trust and a nominee company. They are similar uh, in, in what they do. A nominee company handles assets on behalf of, so they have a fiduciary uh, a relationship with somebody. Uh, and I mean, Bank of England Nominees Limited was always uh, traditionally considered to be the, the, uh, the, the vehicle that was used to, uh, for the Queen's investments. Uh, but that uh, organization has actually just been wound up in the last month or two. Uh, by the Bank of England or in the process of being uh, liquidated by the Bank of England. So that's uh, an interesting little development. We'll, we'll see if we can find out a little bit more about that. I only came across that because I uh, happened to be uh, looking at this story. Uh, well, so what did Theresa May say? Well, she said, uh, trust me blindly. Yeah. As she would. Uh, so, Alex, uh, what's, your, what's your take on this story? Well, as you were already hinting, Mike, I think it's less a case of blind trust and more a case of bl blind faith. Um, that is, that uh, we are supposed to place blind faith in this process. Um, someone's already beaten it to me in the chat box by saying £145,000 to her name. Is that all? I guess her hubby, hubby has all the dosh. You and I were discussing just before we came on air, Mike, that uh, possibly um, Mr May may have a role uh, in, or some of his friends at arm's length in managing the, uh, the assets. And that would put uh, Mrs May in the same category as the only other female prime minister we've had, where, uh, of course, Dennis Thatcher... Uh, had this persona of a bumbling fool and the reactionary type, uh, behind which he pulled many, many financial strings. And then we had in the Labour period, Tessa Jowell, who's now a dame, I believe. She was Minister for Culture, Media and Sport, an awful Blairite job title. And of course, she was involved with the Olympic stuff. And uh, it all got very embarrassing for her when her husband, uh, David Mackenzie Donald Mills, uh, Gordon Bowden always likes to give him the full name, uh, was found laundering mafia money for Silvio Berlusconi. So if you want to tie all those ends together, look at Gordon Brown, uh, sorry, Gordon Bowden, of course, and David Veitch, V-E-I-T-C-H, they're uh, on Facebook, and they have a lot of information. A bit of a trend here of uh, 
politicians in this age of feminism saying you can't possibly accuse me of being a puppet of my husband's uh, you know, uh, financial interest. That would be terribly sexist, wouldn't it? Well, maybe it would. And maybe we will be barking up the right tree as well. Um, well, this is the key point, isn't it, Alex? That, of course, uh, she's put these assets in a blind trust. The blind trust is managed by some trustees, but we don't actually know which company or which group of trustees she has put this in the hands of. That's because it's transparent. Uh, indeed. Any thoughts? Well, these things have a habit of coming out in the end, is all I will say. Um, we always have to be careful not to point the finger where there's no evidence. But uh, if we smell something isn't right, then the thing to do is to put that in the public consciousness and come back to it later. I mean, the damage may have been done by then, but if she steps down and we suddenly find that the money turns up in interesting places with interesting directorships tied to her, then it's the time to look uh, retroactively at what's gone on. But uh, there's been a, a fairly straight track ref record in British and American politics and French of the last 50 years of these suspicions turning out to be jolly well founded. Yeah. yeah. Um, perhaps I could just add to that, um, Alex, that um, the moment uh, Theresa May's name and blind trust came up, my mind was taken back to. Um, Tony Blair, because I think I'm right in saying that uh, it em eventually emerged that a blind trust had been set up, which actually was handling money to help him get elected as a uh, Labour leader. Um, and uh, there was a very interesting little nest of politicians and other people around that blind trust. So do you say the people in the blind trust actually held the political power to get their boy elected? Well, that, that actually ended up with, a, with an, uh, an inquiry and some legislation, which now prevents uh, money from blind trusts going into the coffers of any political party or any political campaign. Right. So, so it was dealt with. OK. Um, OK, Alex, we'll move on to uh, straight to European issues. And uh, this article from uh, the American Interest, uh, You've, you've headlined this to me anyway, that the West is now dropping Erdogan. Uh, and uh, the, the article here uh, entitled The Fall of Turkey. Uh, and you wanted me to quote uh, saying, Erdogan is an erratic opportunist. Uh, when his ambition hits a wall at home or geopolitically, it's his survival instincts prompt him, prompt him to change course. Yes, I think that the key point about Erdogan, and as uh, flagged up by this American interest article called The Fall of Turkey, is that a lot of people have been um, really got, reaching a dead end when they've been trying to work out uh, whose side Erdogan is on in the struggles of, of um, the Near East and the geopolitics at the moment. And I think that question is really unanswerable because, as that um, analyst here says, this article is by Eric Brown, who has a good track record, um, that it's a uh, really a case that he jumps on whoever's bandwagon suits him at the moment, uh, that one of the major stories of 2016 was, of course, the um, apparent uh, putsch attempt in Ankara, which uh, went belly up. And people spent a lot of time wondering, did this mean that the West was ditching Erdogan? Was Erdogan ditching the West? I think it's really a case of him simply trying to survive uh, with his massive ego complex, his sultan complex. There's been a lot of interesting stuff swirling, swirling around Erdogan. I think he's realized now that neither the Americans nor the Germans are going to keep him there long term. He's desperately tried to reconcile himself to Russia and um, even Israel, which was Turkey's longstanding ally. But the point of the American interest piece is really that um, the Turkey that we knew in the 20th century, the cornerstone of stability against both Islam and communism, uh, has really fallen. Uh, you know, so if Turkey wants to turn the tap on, we, I've shown you before Erdogan giving his ranting speeches saying, I'll, I'll release the, the floodgate, I'll open the floodgates and release the migrants on Europe, just like Gaddafi used to do. There's nothing stopping him now. And it's even in some people's interests um, in, in Europe to allow that to happen. Well, uh, you know, kind of a, a diverse uh, coalition of interests. So Erdogan really is going to seize any bandwagon that's going. Um, well, is it in British interest? Because uh, you also wanted me to highlight this uh, Lord Select Committee. This is the International Relations Committee taking evidence today uh, from international NGOs and also a leading Turkish professor uh, on political reform, engagement and organisation across the Middle East. Uh, what, what are we up to uh, holding these kinds of meetings? Well, I mean, I'm going to try and uh, keep up with what the committee uh, puts out about this uh, meeting today. But if you look at who they're talking to, I think it tells us a lot about the emerging split between what the Commons is about and what the Lords is about. This is not a Commons committee, uh, in which case we will be expecting to hear more about uh, bomb Syria uh, and that kind of stuff. This is a Lords Select Committee, the Lords uh, Select Committee on International Relations. And 
Just like the modern lords since 99 has been increasingly stuffed with soft power people, baronesses of uh, of the media and of the non-governmental organisation world, so likewise they're, they're calling such people. Their uh, witnesses this morning were Rebecca Crozier, the Middle East and North Africa programme manager of International Alert, Philip Luther, the Middle East Research and Advocacy Director at Amnesty International, which doesn't seem very interested, by the way, in, in Christians or you know, Jews in the Middle East being persecuted, and Tim Holmes, the Middle East Regional Director of Oxfam. It's all a very cosy club, and the, um, then half an hour later, they called Professor Umut Özkirin Lee, Professor of Political Science at Lund University, Sweden, and Senior Fellow of Sabanji University, Turkey. And the questions, well, this is not exactly what they will have asked this morning, but uh, a, a rough guide is, um, where in the regions is it best to work with young people? When relatively stable countries like Tunisia, ho, 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 Morocco and Lebanon, where, has there been, where there has been some progress in political reform, how can the UK most effectively support these gains and empower the moderate reforms? Reform, reform, reform. Um, what further steps can we take to reassure you that, uh, that the Britain has a rigorous procedure in place to scrutinise arms sales to the region? Ho, ho, ho. And then about Turkey and Syria... Uh, how they've managed to reconcile after being on different sides of the Syrian war, and how enduring is this alliance? It's pretty clear to me what what uh, what we could call UK NGO PLC is up to here. It's looking for self perpetuation and, and reasons to continue sending people and cadging money from the rest of us, from the taxpayer, uh, to continue to wreak havoc. And if they regard Tunisia, Morocco, and and Lebanon as success stories, then God help us. Um, yes, and uh, but it is another example of this this sort of change in policy since Brexit, perhaps that 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 we are going to uh, implement more and more soft power globally, uh, and and interfere in 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 a particular not quite in the way we have done in in the recent past, but maybe harking back to the way that we have done in in the distant past. I think so. And uh, again, as I was saying a moment ago, the difference between the Commons and the Lords. The Commons is largely full of. Um, egotistical and testosterone-laden business people, and that's just the business women. Uh, you know, they're, they're, it's a very uh, chest-beating environment these days. You, you go there really to, to make your mark and, you know, to be a hawk. Uh, the Lords increasingly is made up of people who were never in the Commons. Uh, they just did something for ne the nebulously defined public service or the third sector. They get stuffed in the, the Lords as a party nominee. And their approach is much more, you know, how can we feel good about ourselves? How can we uh, write uh, virtue signalling large upon the the the, the, uh, the canvas of, of the Middle East. Uh, this is even more insidious because um, okay, it's less of a destructive approach in, in in kinetic terms, but ultimately it's about disregarding history and precedent and law and uh, just imposing yourself so that you can feel good about yourself. And that you know, history teaches us that that, that kind of benevolent tyrant is even worse. Okay, well let's uh, move on to Germany then. And uh, fascinating article in FP. Uh... The West should hope that Merkel loses because it's the only way to defend the liberal democratic order, uh, and that's to say goodbye to the German Chancellor. Uh, what's what? Give us a bit of background to what they're saying here. Well, you know, uh, Matthias Matthias the author gives a bit of background himself by saying that a consensus has now emerged among foreign policy elites that Merkel is the last liberal woman standing, and of course, this is the the, the ironic shot of the the G7 in Japan, and of course, all the others have have shuffled off the stage. Obama. Hollande, Cameron and Renzi. And uh, Merkel is uh, very much lionised by some because she's the last of these um, old style anti-populist figures who says, you know, um, cuddle a million migrants, um, you know, beat the, the, the war drums against Russia. All the others have fallen by the wayside. Um, so uh, Matthijs, who I think is a Dutchman, um, is, is OK, we can forgive him, is, is slightly ropey English. But he's, he's being so firm here as to saying that um, the... Um, Liberal order should root for an alternative coalition. I mean, that's, that's pretty uh, strong language, even allowing for him not being a native speaker. He's basically saying that, that Merkel has outstayed her, use, outstayed her welcome and outlived her usefulness. And this is really quite something because certainly in, in America, uh, anyone who's fiercely anti-Trump, uh, particularly of the left-wing persuasion, has long been saying, well, uh, look at Europe, Merkel is still providing you know, moral leadership. So you, you can see that the tide is turning. And this is one of many articles where foreign policy, the magazine, uh, is actually uh, really reflecting since 2016 something a bit more realistic. I think grudgingly they're accepting that there's millions of people in the West who are no longer swallowing the government line on, on foreign policy. So they're having to give some kind of grudging concessions to us. Um, and so is this European view of Merkel, why uh, 
the SPD leader uh, and vice chancellor is saying that, that her austerity is, is going to be responsible for the breakup of the European Union? Yes, it could well be. This is Sigmar Gabriel, who uh, in the German system, because they try to have grand coalitions with the biggest right and left wing parties on board. Um, he's actually the vice chancellor of Germany. That's not quite a, as an important role as it sounds, but he is effectively power sharing with Merkel. And uh, he, he's openly saying now to Der Spiegel, I mean, this, this is really unprecedented for Germany, which has already got, always regarded the EU as a continuation of Germany by other means. That's uh, Peter Hitchens' phrase from a YouTube lecture that's well worth watching. Um, he's now saying that the, uh, the EU may fall apart. Of course, being a socialist, his particular angle on that is, you know, we're not giving enough handouts to people, the usual socialist claptrap. Um, and if we don't give enough handouts, then um, the, the EU will break up. But, but the very fact that he's saying the EU may break up is, is utterly unprecedented. And if you think about SPD figures of the past, um, like um, the, the chancellors of the, of the 70s, and then uh, they, they would be really be turning in their graves because to them, if you give up the EU, then you really have to rethink German nationhood. And I don't think they're ready for that yet. OK, and uh, let's uh, let's move on then to uh, to drones, the, the French army equipping themselves with uh, mini drones from Thales. Now, I'm looking at the story here, and as usual, um, the French are buying French. They have got a, a small company in France called Merio, M-E-R-I-O, which is um, the designer of this gyro stabilized mini drone. The specifications are it's 15 kilograms. It can fly up to 30 kilometers from base and it can be in the air for two and a half hours. And all of those are a doubling of the previous capacity in the classic in the category of, of mini drone. Um, but towards the end of this article is a mention of um, Watchkeeper, which is produced by Thales, a French company, of course, and it's in service with the British Army, it says. And um, it says at the bottom here that the um, the Sagem group, sorry, the Safran group, S-A-F-R-A-N, um, uh, which owns Sagem, I think, um, is producing these um, drones now and is trying to export them to other countries. So I don't see what need the French army has at the moment for as many drones as they're, they're ordering. The, the um, Department of Ordnance in France is, is ordering 210 of these to be in service by uh, 2018 to 2019. The French don't have uh, the kind of uh, ground exposure that the British and American troops do, I think. Um, so this could be a way of just stimulating the order book to get uh, other countries to order these drones. It looks rather untoward. Or, or are they perhaps preparing for some, uh, for some domestic uh, necessity? Well, that, that could be. I mean, if you look at the... Um, the, the zones which have gone out of control of the French government now, the, the French acronym for them is ZUS. And if you just Google that as a, sorry, I should say search that as an image, search ZUS in France, you will find these zones urbaines sensibles, meaning sensitive urban areas, where the, the writ of the French government does not run because the police won't enter for fear of being assassinated. And if you look at the ZUS, it's a whole ring around Paris now, for example. So, um, OK, 30 kilometres from base, I can imagine possibly some, some people in central Paris uh, under a real or inflated threat from these these uh, rioting suburbs, actually, you know, sending the drones out to to, to bomb French suburbs or at least, you know, um, to do some keyhole type assassinations. It's not beyond possibility. Mm, interesting. Um, so, Brian, what's going on with drones in this country then? Uh, well, it's fascinating how the information comes together because Alex picked up on that article of uh, what the French are up to. Here, we've got our Attorney General Jeremy Wright. Um, who is making a statement today about the law. And what seems to be happening is that they're about to, I think the word is adjust the law uh, in order to give them more flexibility to use drones. Is, is, this, is this a bit of uh, sort of retrospective uh, correction? Uh, indeed, and I, I, I'll come, come on to that aspect. But this is uh, part of what uh, has been reported by the Mail at least. Uh, uh, Jeremy Wright is saying the front line has irretrievably altered and the law has to keep up with the changing times. That implies itself or uh, that uh, the law has not kept up. Uh, let's carry on through. He says civilians may die as part of preemptive strikes in a bid to save lives in Britain. So we're getting some interesting political spin in here. It's more or less, don't worry, we're going to kill a few people, but it's all in your best interests. And uh, he goes on, countries need to be able to take necessary and proportionate action where there is a clear, where there is clear evidence of armed attacks being planned and directed against them. So the use of clear evidence is particularly interesting and we're going to comment on that. But let's have a little look at um, Mr. Wright himself. Um, 
And uh, what better place to go than number five chambers? This is where he originates from. And what we find very quickly is this man does not appear to have any real experience. So at the bottom, there's a couple of cases listed. One is to do with football violence and uh, the other one is a VAT fraud. So um, I know that you can go to uh, look at CVs of uh, QCs on a variety, uh, in a variety of chambers, and you can find page after page of very high profile cases of, as they have built up their experience. This man does not appear to have any experience and certainly no um, appropriate experience or valid experience to the extent that even um, uh, other barristers are picking up on it. So I, I believe we've shown a little bit of this in, in the past few weeks, um, but we've got legal cheek here. Go and have a look at that uh, website. This was uh, one of their images. Who is this guy? Uh, so pretty blunt to the point. Uh, this one here, um, reassuring that the new Attorney General, Jeremy, uh, who he, uh, has experience in cases using a video link. So other barristers are basically picking up on the fact they have no idea who this man is. They have no confidence in his experience, but he seems to think he's very big because he's been able to use video links. And I think video links are going to get a mention a little bit later in the news. Uh, here's another one. Uh, and this is um, a lady, Leisha Bond, saying he's my MP and he's useless and he's fully supported everything the government wanted to do. So now we're starting to get an image of this man. And to cover your point, Mike, what, what's been going on? Well, if we go back to May last year, uh, the BBC and The Guardian, uh, as just two sources, were busy, busy pointing out that we were killing people. And this appeared to be outside the law. And of course, the people operating the drones were putting themselves at risk of murder charges. So this is last year. So we're now seeing that we were killing people outside of the law. And then let's remind ourselves of Chilcot. Uh, so Blair, of course, didn't tell the truth about uh, WMDs. Um, so we force a war, a major war with major movements of assets. Uh, nobody's responsible. Now we can set these drones to work. Who is going to be responsible? Um, Alex, if you... Well, you go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, Alex, if you just, just want to comment on that initial... Um, phase of the information, I was then going to show the scale of the drone attacks. Yes, uh, I'm seeing here that um, OUP's uh, Who's Who 2013 uh, says that Jeremy Wright's experience is in criminal law. Now, if a government has any sense about it, the um, MP with criminal law experience uh, is sent to be director of public prosecutions. And uh, the MP, if there is any, who has international law experience, uh, is made attorney general. Uh, that would seem logical, wouldn't it? Because attorney generals write on uh, advice like, can you get away with assassinations? Can you get away with imprisonments and disappearances? That's what that's the bread and butter of an attorney general. And indeed, if it's not the year's 1982, then you also, as an attorney general, um, get to sit in a closed meeting with Mrs. Thatcher and Leon Britton discussing how to cover up uh, certain material. So that's uh, that's the role of an attorney general. Uh, but he's a criminal law by background. He's a, he's a mere LLB, a Bachelor of Law from Exeter, that rather suspicious um, university. We at Cambridge always used to call it the, the Oxbridge Reject Club. Uh, you may have known his brother, Brian, because apparently, um, I don't know if you heard of a, a Commander Wright, but there was a Commander Wright in the Royal Navy, and that is his brother. But no, th this man does not seem to have any experience. And I think David Ellis may have a bit more gen on him because he's MP for a neighbouring seat to David, and David's well in with political yeah. information in the rugby area. Right, right, Alex, just before we uh, move on from this, uh, just, when did the constitutional change, look, sorry, the constitutional change happen? Because if we look at this attempt to change the law retrospectively and we look at the investigatory powers, laws that have recently come in, uh, which are there to justify uh, illegal activity that's happened in the past, when did the constitutional change happen? Because I clearly was asleep at the time. Uh, which permits this type of retros retrospective law being applied? The first time I think I ever heard of retrospective law was indeed the uh, the Investigatory Powers Act. Um, it's totally at odds with uh, every constellation of um, of English law, Scots law, and uh, and every kind of precedent. But uh, 
Uh, I was just happening to be translating this the other day. Uh, if you look at uh, German legal opinions, like the one I was sent to translate, uh, those uh, lawyers in Germany or anywhere on the continent who specialize in EU law often uh, give their learned opinion that unless there's a good reason not to, uh, a pronouncement by the ECJ, for example, that a certain thing must be amended, uh, must act retroactively unless you can find human rights or constitutional reasons not to. That, again, is uh, a case of the continent being diametrically opposed to us. So I think it's just been slipped in under the radar somewhere around the time of the Brown prime ministership. Um, well, we weren't looking. It's completely foreign to, to all our laws and customs. And therefore, again, if it's tolerated and if it's given royal assent, it is yet again a breach of the coronation oath. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if we move on through some of the statistics to show how dangerous this thing really is, uh, we've taken this at face. I'm going to say at face value from a website called Drone Wars. Now, I've been looking at this site this morning. I'm very impressed with the information it has. It's largely based on freedom of information from the Ministry of Defence, and it's got some really outstanding statistics. But if people like to have a look themselves, make up their own minds as to the validity. But let's take this uh, uh, as we've seen on drone wars. And if I just highlight this batch of figures, uh, we're showing um, Reaper operations in Iraq and Syria. So over a thousand. Uh, this is September 2014 to September 2016, over a thousand in Iraq, 542 in Syria and total weapons fired at enormous cost, 545. So we've no idea how many innocent people have been killed as a result of those missions. We have no idea who ordered the missions. We have no idea who was responsible for the missions. But if you want to know where this is going, uh, then we got this information followed by following through that website to this lady, Anna Jackman. And uh, this is one of her uh, tweets out, the, U the US Department of Defense on Perdic drones. Now, they dropped um, 103 uh, of these mini drones in a swarm. And the quote is from the Americans there, they are not pre-programmed synchronized individuals. They are a collective organism. And uh, this is another bit on that uh, Twitter page. So it's got a document from the American Department of Defense crowing about this successful micro drone swarm. Um, it says they're autonomous, adaptive and leaderless. So we're now moving into the uh, state where we say if we've got these things acting as autonomous robots, who is responsible uh, when people are killed as a result of them? They're choosing their own target who's ultimately going to be tried for murder. And let's remember that, uh, of course, we've got governments prepared to lie. So a couple of, well, it's one quote from Donald Trump here. He says, you call it whatever you want. I want to tell you they, the Bush administration, lied. They said there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. There were none. And they knew there were none. There were no weapons of mass destruction. We spent two trillion took thousands of lives. Obviously, it was a mistake. George Bush made a mistake. We can make mistakes, but that one was a beauty. We should have never been in Iraq. We have destabilized the Middle East. So we, we've got governments prepared to lie in order to get uh, massive action in on the ground. Millions of people, in fact, killed. And now they're going to be let loose with uh, these drones. Um, Theresa May sat behind closed doors deciding who she's going to kill? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Um, well, speaking of Donald Trump, Paul Craig Roberts here asking the question or saying, don't count on Trump being inaugurated. And he's <laughs> really, uh, I'll just read a few of the lines of this. Uh, the ruling established this establishment does not intend for Trump to become president. Uh, the latest explosive fake news is that multiple US officials with direct knowledge told CNN that they have classified documents, that Russia has compromising documents on Trump that would allow them to blackmail the US president. The documents consist of memos compiled by a former British intelligence operative whose past work US intelligence officials consider credible. So he's got that all interspersed as quotes. Uh, and he asks, uh, consider these three questions. How would a former British intelligence operative get such extraordinary documents from Russian intelligence? Um, if he had such documents, why would he hand them over instead of selling them to Trump for a major fortune? 
Uh, why would such a crazy story be on CNN and, then, and in the New York Times unless the ruling establishment intends it, to use it to block Trump from the presidency? Uh, and uh, he ends up by saying, uh, Paul Kirk Roberts, that is, uh, what this elevation and wild charges tells me is that the CIA's effort to sell Trump on the rushing uh, hacking did not succeed and the CIA has escalated the attack uh, on the president-elect. Uh, Alex, how would a former British intelligence operative get such extraordinary documents from uh, Russian intelligence? You know, Mike, you're uh, reading my thoughts again. Um, one source I've seen claim claims that this man was an MI6 officer in Moscow in the 1990s. And OK, granted, this was an age when MI6 and the other agencies were very interested in this phenomenon of kompromat, the, the Russian practice in the Yeltsin era of taking dirty photos of people and then uh, using it to bribe them afterwards. Not that uh, Western or Israeli governments do that at all, do they, ho-ho. Uh, but then the concept is a compromise. But I'm, I'm afraid this looks like, um, even if it is a genuine former SIS officer, it looks like he's um, you know, out of luck or uh, hit hard times or something because he seems to be telling tall stories in, in Washington. Um, no one seems to be able to quote his words accurately. Every document that summarizes these claims, which are pretty lurid sexual stuff, every document is full of typos. And if it, there's one thing I can tell you about MI6 officers, particularly of the 1990s vintage, and particularly of the caliber that get posted to Moscow, they do not write typos. They absolutely don't. They, they write proper documents. Why haven't we seen this? And then in the PCR um, blog that you've just read out, what strikes me there is CIA um, type language is being used by the um, the, uh, was it the CIN, CNN, wasn't it, who, uh, who claimed to have this stuff? CIA type source assessment language is being used, but not with reference to the actual source, but to the, the people peddling the claims in America. It all looks like very third hand, fourth hand smoke and mirror stuff. Finally, if this guy really is a CIA asset, uh, as is claimed um, by the, the, the press that's reporting this, then um, in, if, if that is the case, then what on earth is a former MI6 officer doing informing CIA? That looks like a, a massive problem in a special relationship, so I don't buy it. Okay. Okay, well, let's move on uh, and go to uh, the Eurozone. Uh, and Alex, uh, just keeping an eye on the clock, so we'll just uh, go quickly through these next couple of uh, slides. Um, 900 billion in uh, extra debt this year? Yes, but uh, if you work it out, it depends on how many people you think are still taxpayers in the Eurozone. But if you go for a sensible percentage, then it's somewhere between three and four thousand euros per taxpayer extra debt, not total debt, extra debt just this year. And Les Eco, the French business paper, goes on to, it doesn't point out that figure. I had to work that one out myself, of course, but it goes on to point out that the countries uh, that can least afford this debt uh, are the ones taking the most. Italy is the, is the black dot there that's uh, buying, borrowing the most with a population much less than Germany and, uh, and an economy much, much less robust than Germany, yet borrowing a lot more, so much more that it won't even disclose its annual borrowing in the way that the other Eurozone countries do. And then towards the end of the article, it's noted that countries are um, in a cleft stick now. They can't raise their interest rates too high. Uh, ECB, of course, does that for the Eurozone countries anyway. And it notes that there is a trend towards uh, trying to get as much borrowing out of the market as they can at the beginning of the financial year here on the continent. That's contiguous with the calendar year. So right now, January, February, um, in anticipation of things getting worse later in the year. In particular, um, it talks about the, the European debt uh, market and the, the fact that the um, European Central Bank may uh, reduce its uh, buying up of debt policy, which all the Western central banks have been doing, and cut it by a quarter from 80 to 60 billion euros. But as Lysico says, that still leaves a massive amount of central bankers just buying up debt to, to continue keeping inflation near zero. Yeah. OK. OK, well, let's uh, look at uh, this lady, Antonia Romeo. And she is uh, Her Majesty's Consul General, General in New York, or rather she was. She was only appointed to that job in August or so last year. Uh, but uh, she has just been uh, appointed the new Permanent Secretary to the Department for International Trade. Uh, and, uh, well, they're all very excited about that. Uh, she is currently, uh, as I say, Consul General and also Director General Economic and Commercial Affairs in, in the U.S. And over there, she's responsible for the economic and trade relationship between the UK and North America. Uh, previously, she uh, was head of the Economic and Domestic Secretariat at the Cabinet Office, uh, and she's also worked in other roles, which we'll come on to in a second. Uh, Liam Fox, MP, was absolutely delighted with her appointment 
uh, and he said to support the establishment of a world-class trade negotiation function uh, and lead this new profession within the civil service. A new expert second permanent secretary post will also be established in the Department for International Trade, reporting to the permanent secretary. The global search for an international trade negotiating expert to fill this post will open soon. So they're not even going to recruit uh, from uh, the from from the UK. It's going to be a global search. But anyway, uh, here is the lady, uh, and she had to say it's a privilege to have been appointed to lead the department as we work to promote the UK as an outward-facing, free trade global nation. Well, what's her history? Well, she's uh, she used to work for the Department of uh, Justice, um, where she was uh, a transformer. Brian, she looks like a schoolgirl here. Six form, what I'd say, but uh, I think she was born in 1974. Okay. So a, a youngster. But anyway, uh, she was uh, in the Ministry of Justice. Uh, she was part of the uh, uh, just, uh, the transformation of justice, as it was called, transformation justice. And, uh, and she was also uh, really running the whole change agenda. So she is a major change agent. Uh, and uh, so she had this, she sent a, a, a mail out to them uh, at, at some point in 2014 as she was heading up Transforming Justice at the time, saying, Dear Transformers, under the Ministry of Justice's new structure, we will take on responsibility for scrutinizing and assuring that Transforming Justice portfolio, sorry, the Transforming Justice portfolio of programs, a change we're making to reflect our increased focus on major programs as a way to deliver reform including the, transform, the Transforming Rehabilitation Program. Um, and uh, she went on to say, here's what the Justice Committee said in their report on the budget and the structure of the Ministry of Justice. Uh, we welcome the achievements of the Transforming Justice Program and uniting the ministry behind this brand. Uh, this work has helped the department to coalesce around a common purpose. We further welcome the efforts that have been made to involve frontline staff in these changes. Of an early, at an early stage and find evidence of the understanding of and commitment to the programme among staff at every level uh, when we toured the ministry, the ministry's headquarters on an open access basis. So, and then she went on to say, so thank you to all Transformers for your support, ideas and enthusiasm over the last year. I look forward to continuing to transform justice with you. So she has clearly done a spectacular job at transforming justice. She ended up uh, dealing with trade and heading, heading over to New York for no more than six months. And now she's back getting an, a further promotion. But it was the, the, the issue of transforming justice, which I found particularly interesting in her career. Uh, just before we move on, I should probably just uh, highlight uh, an alternative image of her, which is uh, from a, a MySpace page. But anyway, uh, this then brings us to uh, back to you, Alex, because uh, Lord John Thomas here uh, talking about exactly this type of thing. Uh, and I just, uh, I've, I've highlighted the, the beginning of this quote that you sent me, uh, where he says, I, envis I envisage Skype or FaceTime or some other commercial product replacing completely the current video links. And of course, what he's describing is, is exactly the type of reforms in justice, um, which uh, Brian Levison's report uh, was covering in the middle of last year, um, where they are absolutely separating uh, the courts and justice and and face-to-face uh, -face contact with more and more electronic contact. And in fact, the point you're making here, Alex, is that he, from some of the stuff that he goes on to say, um, you, you're not even going to know whether you're facing a judge. No, it's, uh, it's, it's very disconcerting. I mean, uh, it's Lord Thomas of Cungia, this is the name we're supposed to give him, but I'm so glad you called him Lord John Thomas, because some viewers will know that the John Thomas is a, is a colloquialism for something, and I think he's revealing himself to be that very thing. Uh, perhaps he's wanting the whole of the judicial system to be filled with the same kind of transformers. But uh, when I was growing up, I remember the most popular um, children's TV show had a, a theme tune that said transformers were robots in disguise. Uh, maybe there's a bit of truth in that old 80s uh, TV theme tune. Well, what, what Lord Thomas is saying is it's quite outrageous, by the way, for the head of the judiciary of England and Wales to be plugging commercial uh, entities like Skype and FaceTime like that. He could easily have said commercial video links, but uh, no, he wants to. Plug it. It is the annual uh, speech he gave in, um, well, not every year that's him, but he was addressing the annual conference of Legal Wales, which I've um, <clears throat> mentioned before, Cyfraith Gymru, which is a, seems to be a backdoor way of of, um, uh, of transforming English justice because Wales is a smaller and more more um, 
uh, vulnerable jurisdiction. And what he's arguing is that now that there are such things as Welsh measures, which we can't call laws because it's a step down from the Scottish Parliament. OK, so Scotland has a Scottish Parliament and laws. Wales has an assembly and measures. But OK, they're effectively laws because these 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 measures or laws need to be assessed in Welsh tribunals. They had to set up a new category of pseudo judge. And he's saying in his speech that it's utterly um, untoward if Parliament does not uh, allow these Welsh tribunal pseudo judges to sit in the courts of England and Wales, right up to UK tribunal and UK court level. You know, there are several tiers in the judiciary. So he's saying we've created a Mickey Mouse bottom layer in Wales. Uh, now let's use that to infiltrate the whole of the judicial system in England and Wales, right up to the the court, the High Court and the Supreme Court in time, um, just by creating this new layer at the bottom. Uh, and if we don't, he, he suggests, the commercial interests of English law will lose out. He says that. Um, and there is well-financed competition uh, in the common law world from other jurisdictions like Singapore. And so his hint is, if Parliament doesn't do as I say, then we're going to lose lots of spondulics and the court system of England and Wales is no longer going to be the, the, the um, what should we say, the jurisdiction of, of choice for business disputes worldwide. There's, there's no interest at all here in, in common law and our, our, uh, our liberties as, as freeborn Englishmen or whatever. He's just really talking about uh, reinventing the law in Wales and then launching it onto England from there. Um, one of the things that he said here, Alex, is that law is a highly competitive industry. Um, when did clearly there's a separation then between law and justice? Well, my father was um, a Mackenzie friend in the eighties, uh, and uh, often we made a point. Well, one of his rhetorical points was, "Why does a Scotsman have to come to England to, to find out that there's no justice in England?" But uh, another one of his points is that he would say to the judges. Um, you know, I thought I was entering a uh, court of justice here. And at one point, uh, one of these friendly, uh, old fashioned uh, Crown Court judges said, Mr. Thompson, please disregard that, whatever you've been told. When you came in today, you saw uh, courts of law on the outside. These are not courts of justice. These are courts of law. You know, so there, there is very much a difference. Law is a business, as you say. Yes. Well, let's follow through on that serious subject of uh, replacing a personal appearance in court with a video link. And we'll come in through this article. It's from the Mail. Um, this is a rant, and it's a rant because somebody has discovered that uh, in some prisons, instead of just being able to go to the prison shop, prisoners can actually order from a very limited selection of things. They can order items from Amazon, and uh, that can sub subsequently be delivered to them. For example, some uh, prisoners may be allowed to have a radio in a very simple, small, basic radio in their cell. And if they've collected enough uh, money from their employment in the prison, they can order that via Amazon. But in this massive article, um, Tory MP Philip Hollowbone, a very appropriate name, jumps on the bandwagon and says, oh, this is disgraceful. This just shows how people are being pampered in prisons. Remember, we've got a breakdown of law and order in prisons at the moment. but let's." say, in contrast, um, what's happening to Melanie Shaw, because Melanie has literally disappeared into HMP Foston Hall. She has not appeared in court. She has appeared via video link on one, possibly two occasions. And we know that that video uh, link was then cut short. So she's had no proper trials, no medical treatment, months in solitary confinement, letters have been blocked or stolen. Uh, she's been denied basic privileges such as, uh, as uh, shop, shopping from the prison shop. She's been stripped naked for fun. She's been threatened and abused and her home has been uh, ransacked. So this is the reality of the Conservatives' uh, policy on law and order. And uh, we better add in Justice Secretary Liz Truss because she's in the press. Uh, that she's apparently got an extra 500 million, as you do. There's a shortage of money, but she's going to crack down on chaos in the prisons and she's going to hire another two and a half thousand extra frontline wardens. Now, the key issue here, which um, long serving prison wardens are saying, the people coming in being recruited on very minimal wages have no experience as wardens. And this is what's causing the problem in the prisons in the first place. So we've just seen a judge calling for uh, yet more, um, what's the word, IT in the judicial system. So we will not be having people to come into court in person to give their testimony. Very dangerous situation. And uh, Alex, you've got something on food here for us. 
Yes, just to say that uh, if you're concerned about prisons, you could do uh, much worse than to follow this chap, Alex Cavendish. Uh, the Twitter handle, I think, is just Prison UK. I can't see it there, but I think if you look for Alex Cavendish Prison on Twitter, definitely follow this this man because he has some good contacts. And uh, this is one example here. It's a, a picture of a baguette wrapped in, in nasty plastic shrink wrap, um, an uh, oldish looking orange, a small bag of cheesy crisps, um, uh, some apple concentrate drink and some kind of looks like a cheesecake in a bit of plastic. And he says that this was handed out from to a prisoner and will have to last from 12 noon today until lunch tomorrow. Oh, and there's a tiny packet of, of uh, breakfast stuff there as well. Uh, so, sorry, Alex, uh, the thing I noticed about this was that that tweet went out on the 25th of December. And, and what, what was in my mind was, is this what they were getting for Christmas dinner because, because the pr prison was short-staffed over Christmas? I think that very, very much may be it. So instead of getting Christmas dinner, because the, the prison canteens used to make an effort, didn't they? Yes. Um, for Christmas cheer. Um, instead of that, it's almost like a calculated insult. You have a, a stale baguette and a, and a nasty bit of aspartame thrust through the, the bars, and you're told, here you are, that's your, your lunch, your dinner, and your breakfast tomorrow morning. Happy Christmas. Um, this explains, goes a long way to explain why there's riots in prisons at the moment. There's also the factor of deliberate pseudo-Islam being used to, to form ganglands, which then report through prison system and act as, as um, uh, you know, as, as um, ways of keeping tabs on the prisoners and, and turning them out as broken men. Um, so you can see a lot is going wrong there. Uh, and no human contact, as you mentioned a moment ago there with um, no prison shops. Uh, in the book I translated by the Belgian criminologist, he says he was just gobsmacked that when people let out of their cells in the new private prisons, they go to these sort of screens on pillars in the corridors and just punch a couple of buttons and say, here I am, my code is so and so. And they're told, you've been a good boy, you have some credit today, what do you want to spend it on, crisps or sweets? You know, that, that's in lieu of human contact in the canteen. Uh, and of course, let's not forget the smoking ban, which, which, I mean, it just staggered me when they when they announced that because what what did they expect to happen uh, when people that are in a confined space uh, who probably have been smokers, uh, very many of them, end up uh, overnight not allowed to smoke anymore? Yeah, it, it well, was, they they knew it would cause trouble, which is why yeah. they did it, Mike. Um, right, look, Alex, I think we'll we'll finish on this one a piece of good news, um, and uh, this is from the Irish Times. Uh, woman entitled to damages over eviction by council? It is very good news, particularly because there is comity, which means mutual respect of judgments between the Supreme Courts of all common law English speaking countries. So um, John Hurst will know more, more detail on this, but uh, to my mind, this seems that this can be pleaded uh, in England and Wales, in Northern Ireland, in Scotland, and potentially in Canada, the United States, New Zealand, and Australia as well. Uh, and the court has found that there were ser serious problems with the warrant that was obtained by the local council around Dunleary, south of Dublin, for a lady when she was evicted. And uh, the Supreme Court, of course, has got the better judges in it, at least it has in Ireland. And they know that um, if you uh, obtain something fraudulently, then everything uh, further down the chain, as Lord Denning so memorably said in his judgment, uh, is affected. You know, one fraud undoes everything. They can't give the lady her home back, but they've given the council a, a jolly good slap on the wrist. And uh, I think it may be time that uh, judges are becoming aware at the higher echelons that councils just tell barefaced lies when they lies when they obtain false warrants. Yeah, well, that, well, that's a good a good place to end. Uh, it is. Alex, thank you very much for joining us. As, as always, serious news. The, the prison, the state of the prisons and the drones is, is a key area which will encourage our, our viewers and listeners to look into themselves. Um, if you like what we do, please consider taking out a subscription and or making a donation. We can only do what we do with your help. And as we have said repeatedly, uh, we would like to expand the range of news that uh, we're providing and we would like to expand the number of people we're able to bring in on a daily basis. To do that, we need more uh, financial support from you, our viewers and supporters. On that note, we'll say thank you very much. We'll be back uh, same time tomorrow and we'll be joined by um, David Ellis from Strategic Defence Initiatives. Join us then. Thank you. Bye-bye.